Um, so, why did you why did you write it? <laughs> For a long, long time, um, something that I was taught at school rang in my head, and it was Thomas Carlyle saying, "The history of the world is but the biography of great men." Mm. And for a long time, I actually thought that was true. You know, you and I are pretty much contemporaries, <laughs> age-wise. So we were girls growing up in, in the 50s. And yes, a little bit of education would be good for us so that we could <laughs> bring up our children to be good men, and <laughs> in your case, women. Um, but really not too much. Not much was to be expected of us. And then as we grew older, that education started to make us think, hang on a minute, Carlisle, what were you on about? And where are all the women that we really should know about? So I was very lucky to work on a programme called Woman's Hour. Um, and just at the time when investigations into women's history were mm -hmm. becoming serious academic subjects. And Women's Hour, I think, is always trying to reflect those women. Um, and then, a couple of years ago, um, somebody in education decided that feminism should no longer be studied uh, by sixth form history students. Um, and this took me back to when my younger son, Charlie, uh, came home with his A-level history book and said, Mom, th there's something wrong in this book. And I said, what? He said, well, there are no women in it, apart from half a page on the suffragettes. And I thought you said they were a really important revolutionary movement. <laughs> and I said, well, yes, yes, they were. Um, and I was so pleased that my... I mean, he is my son, so I suppose... <laughs> he would have some idea that, um, you know, women and girls are not just there to do the washing up and do the cooking, um, and that, you know, he and his brother were just as likely to uh, live with vets, photographers, journalists, uh, as do the same kind of thing that, that they would be doing. So they were very aware. But that really, really angered me that Mary Wollstonecraft was to be the only woman that was to be studied. So I thought, okay, let's do a book um, that all those children at school and perhaps some grown-ups ought to know about. So, so how did you choose the people? With great difficulty. Yes. Um, I start with Bodicea. I insist upon calling her Bodicea. Yeah, where does this Boudicca <laughs> On account of Boudicca being the <laughs> ugliest sounding name yes. I have ever come I across. I call her Bodicea too, Good. from yeah, the 50s. Probably I mean, our generation. Absolutely. Yeah. Boudicca, no. But uh, she was... I, I loved riding horses um, in the days when I was fit enough to do it. You know, that's the thing about the Queen. I remember... She's not in here, by the way, Queen Elizabeth I, even though... When I saw her on her 90th birthday a year ago, on a horse, walking around probably Buckingham Palace Park with her equerry, um, astride her horse at the age of 90. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, I, she's got, what, 20 odd years on me and I wouldn't even have been able to mount, let alone uh, go a stride. Um, but I got to love horses because of my grandfather, who was a winder in the pit, and his best mate was the guy who looked after the pit ponies. And when they were called up, <coughs> one of the great things about my family life is that my grandfather was called up in 1918, and my father was called up in 1945. So we were blessed to have men who did not see the horrors of either of those wars. So when my grandfather was called up, uh, he said to his mate, look, I, I suppose we'd better join the infantry. And he said, hey, no, lad, we're not joining infantry. That, we're from Yorkshire, by the way. Um, <laughs> not bloody likely, he said, we'll join Royal Horse Artillery. And my grandfather said, no, we can't do that. I can't ride. And his mate said, don't worry, lad, they'll bloody teach you as indeed they did. And then when they came back, and many, many years later I was born, this guy's daughter 
opened a riding school where the pit ponies, who were now coming out of the pit because of automation, um, she would have a riding school using the pit ponies. So I learned to ride at the age of two under my grandfather's instruction. Um, the first thing he taught me was how to fall off, which was quite good, really, because um, you do that quite often. Um, and so I developed this absolute passion for horses. Now, we lived in Barnsley, so coming to London was a really big thing. Um, and my parents decided they would bring me to London when I was 11. I'd just passed the 11 plus. Um, and we went all around, and uh, there were lots of statues. Um, not many, I think, apart from Queen Victoria, were women. There were similarly not enough. And if anybody complains about Millicent Garrett Fawcett going into Parliament Square, I will be very, very cross, probably because I'm the president of the Fawcett Society, but the suffragettes and the suffragists must be equally given credit for what happened when we finally won the vote. Uh, and I'm quite happy for Emmeline Pankhurst to be in Manchester, where she started. I also know Manchester very well. Um, but Millicent really must be here. Um, okay, so we came to London and we saw all these statues and my dad said, oh, that's Lord so-and-so and that's King so-and-so. And, and, and then we came to the embankment yeah. and there was this statue, these horses rearing up, looking really fierce and unmanageable, and a woman with a spear and a crown and behind her two Daughters. I didn't know they were daughters at the time, but I learned later that they were. And I said to my dad, oh, dad, who's that? And he said, oh, hang on a minute. And he read, he said, oh, that's Bodicea. Now, I didn't know anything really much she got mentioned at school. And when I started to research her, uh, and I discovered the reason she did what she did was because those wretched Romans came here um, as she was married to the king of her Celtic tribe. Am I going on too long? I do well, tend to do this. Well, quickly finish both so we've got time to talk about some others. Uh, There's right. so many, but it's a very good story. Sorry, Keep going. I know, but, you know, she... So they came. Her husband died. Uh, he had left his uh, lands and his money to his wife, and the Romans said, uh-uh, can't have that. Roman women do not inherit so she was whipped, and her two daughters were raped, which is as good a reason as any to take up arms against the most powerful army in the world at the time, which she did. And, of course, she lost. But what I love about Verdicea is that if only she had won that war and the Romans had been beaten, the sexual politics of this country <laughs> might have been so different if we'd inherited it from the Celts and not the Romans. <laughs> That's okay. true. Well, I mean, the whole of history would have been different if, yeah, she'd, done, well, if she'd won. But um, <laughs> what I liked very much about the book was there's some I know, some I don't. I mean, someone like Ethel Smythe. I have to say, I know shamefully, like nothing Ethel about Smythe. Ethel Smythe. I, I mean, what I tried to include in the book was a, a huge range. Uh, my novelist is Jane Austen. Sorry about that. Um, but, you know, I love her. Um, Fanny Burney is in there, not mm -hmm. because she was a great novelist, uh, but because she had a mastectomy in Paris with no yeah. anaesthetic, and she wrote beautifully about it. And that I have included what she wrote in the book, because it is so stunning. Um, and she lived for another 30, 40 years after it. Um, Ethel Smythe, uh, so there are artists and, and composers. Ethel Smythe is the composer. What I love about Ethel Smythe is, and so often in this book, you find that fathers have been really important in enabling their daughters to get the education and to do what they really wanted to do. Ethel wanted to be a composer. So she finally persuaded her father to let her go to Germany and study composition. But as a little girl, she had played cricket with her brothers, and they had taught her to bowl over arm. So when she came back to England, and, you know, she's not the greatest composer, but then an awful lot of men are not terribly great <laughs> composers. Um, she's not quite Mozart, but she's <laughs> good. Um, and she did compose something called The March of the Women. 
Um, mm. And she got involved with those terrible suffragettes, you know, uh, Emmeline Pankhurst. And Emmeline said, oh, you told me that you learned to bowl with your brothers. Can you teach us how to throw stones? So <laughs> Ethel Smythe taught the suffragette movement how to throw stones through windows. Good on her. To make a point. Um, <laughs> And she was also very open about, her, about being a lesbian. She wrote very openly about it. But what I loved most about her was when she went to Holloway Prison for her stone-throwing activities, um, a whole group of suffragettes came to the much-lamented Holloway Prison and sang the March of the Women in front of her window. And with her toothbrush, she threw the bars conduct them. Oh, that's so cool. That's such a great story. So if we can jump right up to the present, um, you put Nicola Sturgeon in. I did. As your last person in the book. I did. So why? Well, why is she changing where? If it's a history of Britain in 21 women, and she has been described as the most dangerous woman in Britain, uh, and she may well be the woman who, who takes, who takes obliterates Scotland the union away, um, but she's also a very, very interesting young woman. She's, she's the first politician to have achieved the kind of status that she's achieved, to, right from the outset, be openly feminist. Her first speech, mm. when she got this position that she has now, she had her young niece with her. And she said, you know, that she hoped, during her political career, her niece would grow up and she would not know what unequal pay meant, mm -hmm. what impossible childcare meant, what inequality meant. And I thought, yeah, good on you, Nicola. So you have, as you were saying, done Women's Hour for 30 years, five more years than Alex Dunbogue. Yeah. I've got two long-standing icons here. Um, do you feel, this is kind of going off the subject of your book, but I mean, one thing that shocked me very much the other day when we were doing something of, that the, the, the eight demands that were made by the 1978 Women's Conference in Manchester, only one of them's been achieved, and that is that there is free contraception. Every single other one is, we're still not there. What do you, do you think that Nicola Sturgeon is going to be able to pull this off for her niece? Well, she might in Scotland. <laughs> Do you get disheartened? I, I think you and I get very disheartened, don't we? About some things, At absolutely. Some I mean, things. I quote you often because I say, my friend Jenny Murray, when she tried to get a mortgage, she had a job at the BBC, this is 1972, and she was told she couldn't have the mortgage unless her dad signed the papers, or her husband, and or she didn't husband. actually I have, have to one have a at husband that point. Or my father. And, uh, and I quote decide. that so often. So and that's always very encouraging because you think, well, we've got a lot further than that. Is there one woman in here who you would say moved it more than any of the others, moved the dial for us? Do you know Barbara Castle is... is oh, talk is, about her, because she was oh. so amazing. Did you meet her? Yes. Did you have her on the programme? Several times, yes. It was Barbara Castle who said to me once, oh, Jenny, she said, you know, sometimes I do think you young feminists go a bit far. <laughs> <laughs> she said... I don't care if they call me the chairman, the chairwoman, the chairperson, or the chair, as long as I'm in the chair. <laughs> she was That's also so great. a great fan of Tricell. She, this, this was the first time I met her when I was a young television presenter, producer, in uh, Southampton. And she came in, and I had a sort of cupboard where I used to go and put my makeup on. And she came in, and I was terribly nervous and terribly impressed. And she said, oh, can I go in there to, to change? And I said, oh, yes, of course you can. Come in. And showed her. She opened her suitcase and she took out this dress and she shook it out. She said, look at this marvellous tricell. You can curl it up as much as you like, take it out, give it a shake. You never have to iron it. <laughs> such a horrible material, but she it did look still, yeah, no, fantastic Replaced by Izzy Miyake nowadays. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And of course, you know, the other one, uh, I mean, Barbara Castle had such an influence in the Equal Pay Act, the Sex Discrimination Act, and it was after I was refused that wretched mortgage, even though I had saved up the deposit, I had enough to pay off the monthly payments, 
Um, and when the Sex Discrimination Act was finally enacted, I went back to all the mortgage company, companies in Southampton and said, right, give me my mortgage or I'll take you to court. I'm not sure I would have ever been brave enough to do that, but I did get my mortgage. But uh, Margaret Thatcher is the other person who some people say, and why did you have to put Margaret Thatcher in your you book? Had to have well, Margaret of Thatcher. course you had to have Margaret Thatcher in the book. Um, and she was quite the most terrifying character I've ever come across. You'd, you'd go down to Downing Street to interview her. She had blue eyes which would mm. pierce mm. right into you. And she was waiting for your slip up if you hadn't quite done your research. And she would literally tear you limb from limb. And it was her great pleasure to tear journalists limb from limb. Um, and so many times I would try to get her to talk about being the woman prime minister. It was always referred to. Her gender was always yeah. referred to. And she would always say, oh, Jenny, I'm not a woman prime minister. I am the prime minister. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. So then when she was deposed and she wrote what I'm afraid to say was the most boring autobiography <laughs> has ever been my misfortune <laughs> to have to plow my way through. Um, but I did plow my way through it trying to find her real... Because I thought, you know, other women who want to come into politics might find how she dealt with these things useful. Um, and so I ploughed my way through it, and there was one reference to when she first met her cabinet, who were, of course, the, the old men um, of the Conservative Party, and uh, she said that they had treated her as if she were the cleaning lady. And yes. so, of course, she sat them all. Uh, and brought in the boys that she could control. Uh, and I thought, oh, great, there's a hint here. I can, I can get into this. So she came into the studio rather than me having to go to Downing Street. And there she sat with the blue eyes boring through me. Um, and I put together a question which included the cleaning lady and the fact that Alan Clark had drooled over her ankles in his diary uh, during Prime Minister's Question Time, and the fact that people always referred to her giving people a hand bagging. Nobody ever says a man gave anybody a brief casing. Um, and also that President Mitterrand had described her as having the eyes of Caligula and the lips of Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> and the reviewer of the Sunday Times the following Sunday said it was the only time ever his radio had frozen over. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.